Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. Um, I'm here for another impromptu ramble, um, this time with a previous guest of the channel, um, one Constantine Bulkwill, um, who was here last on, uh, uh, I think, for the original Sunday ramble we had um, back in, I think, November 2022, um, which seems like a long time ago now. Um so the topic of this stream is, uh, broadly speaking, the work of Julius Evola. Um, and I'm sure watchers of the channel will know that um, I'm quite a devoted reader of Evola, even if I have some considerable um, disagreements on various things. Um, and one aspect of Evola I'd neglected um, when I originally sort of did a big binge read of all his work um, right at the start of the sort of COVID era, because I had the time to, was um, his works on Tantra, and a three volume set i believe called introduction to magic um mm. which i deliberately didn't buy because i assumed it was about more esoteric stuff i simply wasn't um i wouldn't say wasn't interested but kind of wasn't really ready for um i thought there was more kind of immediate more important stuff to deal with first um but it appears based on what mr Falkwell has been telling me recently that this is in fact not the case um and there is quite considerable information um, which I had missed out of, of considerable importance. Um, so, yes. So tell us about how you came to see, um, to, came to read Introduction to Magic and that sort of thing, that aspect of Evelyn. All right. So um, hello, everyone. So I came on to reading Introduction to Magic stuff after having about a two-year stint reading first the works of Dion Fortune and Gareth Knight. Um, so they're, um, well, they're, they're both uh, English authors that are kind of on the um, slightly quacky side of it. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly pulled to them from the works on the Arthurian stuff, which then nicely led into Evela's book, The Mystery of the Grail. I see. So. That's another one I've not read, actually. <laughs> yeah, that one's fantastic. Um, while I'm on that, in Volume 3 of Introduction to Magic is his proto-essay for the book. So he wrote that like 15 years after he wrote that essay in 1929. Right. And that's fantastically raw and has all of the, the nice kind of buzzing essence that's ready to go into the book in it. Mm. Um, yeah, so I read Mr. the Grail, but I'd also read The Hermetic Tradition, and that was kind of the first serious book I read that was a decent prep before going into all of the all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of glad I did do it that way because um, as it so happened at the time I was reading it, it was concurrent with, um, I was actually coming up with a, a Black Crusade scenario for a role-playing game. And mm -hmm. the story I was unfolding in that seemed to follow the, al the alchemical process that we were realizing. So I was right. like, I'd do something in the game, and then a week later, I'd read what I was actually doing in the Hermetic Tradition. It's quite spooky. There's some fun concurrences as well. But anyway, that's set up for understanding some of the really, really deep language when it talks about things like being Saturnine or anything that relates to the planetary um, vibes, I yeah. guess. Um, I'm sound and like a <laughs> crystal is it? Level. Is it safe to say, basically, that when Evel actually came to sit down and write Introduction to Magic, he had developed quite an in-depth understanding of this sort of field, um, which is not easy to get into, <laughs> really, I suppose. Well, so the um, so the chronology of the books is, so you've got volume one, two, and three from 1927, 28, and 29. 27 and 28 are when he's with the Ur group, mm -hmm. who's a few fellow esotericists at the time, mostly Italians. Some of them are Freemasons, though, and he actually ends up having a falling out with them. So then in 1929, he goes off and forms the career group. He takes right. some of the guys with him. Like, and essentially, the big jump I've noticed from starting to read Volume 3 is the quality skyrockets, because he's so heavily curated it. But um, he does a few other revisions to these in 1971. And there's, you know, in the latter editions, there's some other essays dropped in to kind of give them more that weren't in the original, well, what was released as a magazine, effectively. Right. So they were, um, it was a collection of periodically released essays that got compiled later on. Mm -hmm. So some of the other stuff handed in is with his many decades hence of experience. 
Athletes written stuff like the Yoga of Power, Eros, Meditations on the Peaks. Okay. And he's also the editor for it. So oftentimes the book will say note by her, which is him. Mm -hmm. is adding more context and just embellishments to it. Okay, so I guess that this, <laughs> this is not as um, easy of a question as it might sound, I suppose, but how do you see the kind of magical doctrines more broadly as fitting into the the as fitting into the kind of central positions on Evola? Um, because when I first came to him, I sort of made the mistake of assuming that they're sort of tangential or that they're a kind of separate thing. No, um, they're completely fundamental to it. Right. So, um, well, I don't, well, I won't reference my, my speech too much back in August, but what I was mostly getting at with that is critical to everything he expounds is, is the premise that Essentially, what he's saying isn't his own novel thought. It's him being a conduit for primordial truths. Yeah. So, in effect, he's just this guy with like he's a really good fishing rod and really knows what he's doing. Like he's like the Jeremy Wade of picking out <laughs> like truth bombs with yeah all the spiritual background stuff. And he's just the guy that's best at doing it and pulls it out and knows what he's got and knows how to like fillet it. And serve it on a gourmet plate. Okay. Not so, to discount just the experience he has through the war and his political writings, but ultimately, still, it's him always being tuned into this fundamental background that pervades a whole other dimension separate to manifest reality. So, this is kind of the very top level of his metaphysics, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I think we, we did actually agree we were going to start with a, a talk on uh, meditations on the peaks. Um, yeah. And indeed, I think someone in the chat actually asked if it was um, if it was worth, worth reading. reading. Yes. I mean, pretty much everything by Ebola is worth reading. Um, yeah. uh, yes, it is very much so. so. So how did you first come across meditations on the peaks and what appeal? I mean, I, I know the answer to this question, but yeah. what, what appeal did it have to you specifically? So... Spending a lot of time hiking in the Wrecking Beacons, especially mm. in the depths of winter, there is something very potent about it. And the yeah. experience you have going through like a liminal space of the fog banks up to peaks, a whole other world above a sea of white and glistening sunshine and frozen tops. And it's like those experiences he captures, but mm -hmm. when he gets just even bigger, more extreme ones, because he's doing it in the Alps, and he does actually say in one of the essays that. I don't really truly experience this stuff till you're over 6,000 feet up. Right. Which is a problem for us in the UK, but maybe 300 feet being like the highest. But okay. um, I try to remember the time I actually came to read it because it was, it was almost like a one off thing in its own right that it's like that strange feeling you read something and it's so major that it doesn't matter the context or the time in which you read it and it seems to be like above the time of it mm -hmm. so i can't remember where i actually went and bought it but okay. i do remember um being very very taken by it and also as um as explained right at the start of it the editor had access to the collection of evler's original nicholas rorick artworks and so yeah. i just went on a, a massive spree just looking at loads of those fantastic paintings and realizing that so in the writings of this book Elder's captured in words these sensations and in painting Rorick has captured these scenes and the paintings themselves could just give you an entire like several page spree worth of just impression of what it's like mm -hmm. um, I mean on the on the point about sort of um, the very unique spiritual sensation one feels when kind of hiking or, or you know, up, up in the mountains as such. You know, there's that meme that um, mountain climbing and mountaineering is like a, it's like a very European thing. Like barely yes. any other ethnic group actually bothers to do it. Like, yeah. um, I mean, even 
even even the Sherpas and and the Nepalese, you know, who live who live pretty much, you know, on the slopes of those mountains. Um, actually, if you look at their history, they made very little attempt to ever climb them. Like they yeah. they were they were very content to just sort of stay in the valleys. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, um, um, Arabs and um, Africans are very averse to even the concept of uh, going up a mountain. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. There's that meme where it's like, you know, just like why do why do white people climb mountains type thing? Um, because because I think, I mean, this this is quite a reductionist um, reading of what Evola thought or said, but um, I, I I know that he basically has a certain notion of racial hierarchy, yeah, um, in which everyone is in some way descended from a kind of higher um, spiritual being, mm -hmm. and basically europeans are the least devolved from that state so yeah. essentially the, the the sort of it's it's like an ancestral longing to be once again above the clouds um so so, so to speak um mm -hmm. or to be kind of you know to have mastery over the earth that you feel when you're on top of a mountain um yeah. and and i think solitude in particular plays an important part because i i think one of the most um striking signs of a good intellect and a good especially a good scholarly or poetic intellect is the ability to appreciate solitude um and the best kind of solitude in my view one could possibly have is when one is alone at the top of a mountain mm -hmm. um, um so fingles right there that um yeah so it was actually conceived as a collection by Renato del ponte Right. So this is the guy who approaches Evola in 1971 and says, oh, "Can I compile this, please?" And Evola says, "Right, yes." And also, his access to my collection of Rorix to include in the first two editions of the book. The first two prints have Rorix work in it, mm -hmm. but the third edition, which is the one that I've got and it's the one that you can buy now from Image Editions, doesn't have it in there. But um, yeah, I think it's one of the essays, I think it's the one on Gross Glock, no, where he actually talks about finally realizing what the true meaning of Imperium is. Okay. Um, so, so something that's pretty often with him being Italian and very Ghibelline is he, he wants mm. to he wants to keep harking back to the the old Roman spirit, like the pre-Christian Roman spirit. Yeah. And a lot of time he'll invoke those kind of images when he's on these peaks. But it's especially so when he goes up this colossal height and there's just a few eagles flying around he's just like i get it i know what this is now so it's kind of um a spiritual or intellectual realization learned through the senses basically that you know uh, le le learned through a physical revelation as, as, as opposed to an intellectual intuition if that makes sense it's the it's the physical environment and the stirring of the senses and the peril you put yourself in that causes uh, what he talks about mostly in ride the tiger mm -hmm. the crisis moment that's critical to having these revelations so it's not most it's not like explicitly a sensory or an intellectual thing that this it is it's just like this whole extra thing that it is spiritual it's not sensory mm -hmm. it's not logical it's separate you have to have this crisis moment. The others kind of breaking down of their inability to fully handle what it is, and for them to, well, as I do talks about a lot, is until you have this realization, these other faculties of the body kind of keep trying to hem in your soul from seeing this stuff. Okay, and it, it'll find its ways to translate, manifest reality into its own assertions, almost. He never, he never uses the word prison, but that's me being a heretic coming out of that. But it eventually it's saying that you've got to get to the point where the, the body just can't handle it. And then you, the actual soul can break out and realize what it's seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, we kind of touched on it there. Could you kind of um, flesh out a bit more this concept of Imperium? as 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 a kind of um if i'm not mistaken a kind of teleology you know as as something that needs to be established or moved towards in all these different realms um obviously the realm of the material and the political or the realm of the spiritual as such so 
You can't really get it just from this essay and meditation on the piece, but when you tie in what he talks about in Men Among the Ruins with, well, actually quite a lot of the books. So as you read the other day, the one on um, hierarchy, the manabans and orders coming up. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the most critical thing that is explicitly stated in chapter two, but worms its way in the rest of it is um, kind of man being super individual. So in God, I've read so much of it today that I've got so scattered, but um, there's a point where you have the individual and you have the person and the ultimate realization is being a person in the sense that you've transcended your own personality and become an avatar of the greater ideal to which you're living to. Whereas an individual is just an atomite who descends below the personality and just becomes just this unit with no reference. Okay. It's, it's a complete inversion of what best achievement is. But um, essentially Imperium as a whole is kind of like a blend of the manifest destiny, but also the inner spiritual will from, as you state, the Hyperborean will to just make grand civilization and just embark on this journey like we back towards what we'd evolved from. Yeah. And Imperium is kind of like the, the raw spiritual power becoming apparent that whoever does it has to be able to realize this in kind of a its own version of the golden age. And I'm I'm quite interested in this idea that even if someone is, you know, that kind of their you you might say suited or capable of achieving it, they still need some kind of crisis point. Yeah. Or so like it, you know, it's it's like if you want to if you want to make something fine out of a piece of metal, you've got to put it in a furnace, right? Like there's got to be the there's got to yeah. be an input of energy from somewhere or a yeah. a moment at which it can become malleable. Um, it, it reminds me a bit of um, the poet uh, 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 Rambo um, mm. when he was you know he was barely out of his teens and he embarked on this terrible two year homoerotic love affair with Paul Villain. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it was, all, it was one of, it was dreadful. You can read it. His, his, his account of it is literally called a season in hell. Um, and it ended with Villain shooting Rambo. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can see how that ended up. Um, but one of the things he remarked is that the only reason he was able to write such great poetry in that time is because he made his life a living hell quite deliberately. Yeah. Essentially, he he plunged himself into that, knowing it was going to be awful, but knowing he ne he needed the fuel um, yeah. to bring about something great. Uh, so well, I, there, I suppose it's, it's a similar sort of concept, isn't it? Yeah, there, there's something in reality being so unpleasant that it it forces the soul to get angry enough to try and break its bonds and effectively dip into the meta realm where the soul knows where all this stuff is, but. Manifest Man doesn't necessarily know it's there. Right. I mean, I, I do remember read. I don't remember which which book or which essay it was from, but there's a there's a, a section where Evola argues that um, one of the issues with the modern world is that we see rage and we see this kind of primal anger. And I mean, what, what we would meme is like, you know, chimping out, basically. Yeah. We see it as something to be suppressed and that is uh, essentially alien to kind of, you know, like soft, feminized, liberal society, as it were. But he yeah. says that it's uh, it's an extreme, it's a, he says he sees it as a very healthy emotion and sort of a part of a part of one's regular life um, that in any healthy society would would have kind of legitimized outlets. And, you know, there'd be a place for rage. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, you mentioned there that, you know, this the this anger has a lot to do with it um, as, a, as a fundamental emotion. Um, so the the anger to an extent is endemic for the reaching the crisis point in one of one of three ways he describes it being achievable in the end of Ride the Tiger. So um, so on that there is like the nomad soul that can just do it anyway, just is a noble birth and has the means, but they still gotta they sort of do a process like a rite of passage to activate it. Yeah. And then you've got the one who achieves it through crisis. He, he describes it as being like a vase that breaks when the last drop is put into it and all of it just flows out. 
Mm-hmm. Or like, you know, like there's no point in levee breaking with no water behind it because so nothing happens. But if it's full, it floods. And yeah. that's when you have the actual realization. And the other, the third one he talks about is where he actually makes a, a disagreement with Gwen on, because he says Gwen on kind of focuses on it too much, where you have to rely on existing initiatic organizations to pull you in and put you through the process. Okay. So effectively, they just don't, there's not really around anymore. Like there's several cases in history where they've gone underground, like the Rosicrucians, where they just seem to disappear or like mm. the Templars getting taken out. Um, but instead, we've got this endemic just swathe of new spiritualist movements instead that try and sweep you up, which he talks about the um, the counter initiation in the first edition of Introduction to Magic. And that was an essay I pulled quite heavily on in my speech where he's writing it under the pseudonym of Arlo in that one. So that's another key point with the introduction to magic books. They all, all the guys in it use pseudonyms because as they say at the start, doesn't matter who we are or what our background is, focus solely on the merit of what we say. So that that's mm. actually a very important perspective to keep in mind when you are reading this. Well, I mean, that's something um, I briefly discussed it with AA um, on the uh, cigar stream. Mm. um on monday night um which is that one of the bizarre things that a lot of liberals and leftists do is they make use of kind of inconsistent ad hominem right in that that, like so they're they're incapable for example of sitting down and um say absorbing something like evola um in an intellectually honest way because they just reject him as a figure right they just, you know, he's, I mean, like, there was a bunch of, I, I saw a load of them attacking him back in sort of 2020 when he gained some traction online um, for being a cripple. <laughs> it's like, I thought, it's like, you know, these, these, yeah. these, these are all people who are like, you know, oh no, uh, you know, this is a pro-feminist, pro-retard, pro-disabled <laughs> space. Uh. You know, every, every, everyone needs to be allowed in. And it's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not reading that fascist idiot he was in a wheelchair it's like, you know, <laughs> utterly utterly um inconsistent yeah. logic well so, um, so funny enough, on, on this particular phenomenon i actually did um stick a note in rider tiger on a on a paragraph exactly on this i mean you read it out if you don't mind yeah please do should, well, should, should uh, maybe read the uh, the paragraph for context as well yeah so um fairly big paragraph so this is in the chapter where he's talking about the dual aspect of anonymity which mm. relates to the formation of the personality cult, yeah. which we see far too much with Twitter personalities, right? Mm-hmm. So he says here, um, the emphasis on the human and individual I, the basis of humanism, would survive only in the byproducts of the 19th century bourgeois cult of the I, associated with a certain aesthetic cult of heroes, geniuses, and nobility of spirit. But to meet any of the current defenders of personality, one must descend yet another degree to where all the vanity of the eye predominates. It's exhibitionism, worship of one's own interiority, the craze of originality, the boastfulness of brilliant literati and ambitious bellatrists. Even with regard to art alone, this personalism almost always appears joined to an inner impoverishment. Lukacs, though generally opposed to our position, made the legitimate remark the present day practice of overestimating and exaggerating the importance of creative subjectivity actually betrays the weakness and poverty of the writer's individuality. They distinguish themselves merely by eccentricity, either spontaneous or painstakingly cultivated. Their worldview is at such a low level that any attempt they make to go beyond subjective immediacy threatens to leave their personality completely flat. The more that this is the case, the more weight is placed on pure, immediate subjectivity, which sometimes is, in fact, identified with literary talent. The character of normative objectivity that was proper to true traditional art is altogether lacking. So emphasis here on immediate subjectivity versus normative objectivity. Yeah. So traditional art is altogether lacking of the normative objectivity. The category that Shuan has effectively categorized as intelligent stupidity includes almost all the intellectual efforts in this area. And he's talking about traditional art now? 
he's mentioning it there in pointing out that so i mean he's, yeah, he's writing in like 1960s here but we're still seeing it now and still see it with <clears throat> shan't name names but obsessions with who you are what you appear to be how quirky you are <laughs> it's like mm. people who fabricate a personality based on things they like rather than what they do yeah and um he, it's kind of like what he's having to go at is people just making stuff for the sake of stuff that's expression of their personality rather than expression of anything higher yeah i mean that's um that certainly sums up um most of what we see now coming out of um i mean not i was going to say contemporary art but that's, i mean not even just that i mean it's just kind of everywhere <laughs> it's um i mean you could you could literally bring it all the way down to uh you know like the the redditor whose personality is the uh is the tv and video games mm. that, he's, that he watches right yeah um, so yeah. Well, it's like so something he kind of he kind of tunes in but doesn't explicitly state whereas perhaps now it's more apparent that so people would be more inclined to do this quirky expositions of their own egotistical personality where they lack an actual belonging to something serious something with deep roots crucially so like a long-standing culture so they kind of have to to find a relevance whereas before they'd be relevant as a person in a civilization with a role they are simply an individual lost in a sea of just disillusion where they have to find their own culture and almost make one that ends up becoming a cult of personality. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's essentially there's there's really nothing to them. They're about as um they're about as shallow as a bedpan, as it were. Yeah. Um <laughs> but so when we consider, I mean, just to use himself as an example, a personality like Evola, hmm. um, who I said, I mean, it's it's somebody always in search of higher things as a conduit, yeah. um, because you, I suppose, it's easy to expect when we're used to being around such people that someone like Evola would deliberately put up a kind of complicated front you know or pretend to be um you know superficially wise or to kind of um you know ha affect some kind of quirk or or sort of personality type um in order to accommodate this as, as, as an attempt at a sort of an aesthetic um but assuming that the assuming that it's a true book then the book uh the sufi of rome um, which deals with various people who knew him in the last sort of 10 years of his life um, hmm. would seem to paint entirely, entirely the opposite case that, you yeah. know, with all of this knowledge and all of this insight into things that most people could barely begin to comprehend. Um, he was a remarkably, I don't want to say normal as in, you know, as in, as in normie, but he was, <laughs> he was a remarkably kind of um, affable man. Yeah. Um, and he didn't, he didn't affect, I mean, someone like Alistair Crowley, who you know much more about than I do, but he always seemed to me to be a tremendous uh, poseur. Yeah. Um, in that he was always, you know, like, you know, r running around in robes with eyes on his head and, you know, uh, all this kind of, all the weird rituals around the lake in Scotland and everything. I mean, it all seems a bit like uh, theatre. Yeah. Know? Um, and, and, and in fact, what's it might be interesting to make a written comparison of this one day, but um, uh, Yukio Mishima, um, who's a figure I very much admire, um, takes kind of a, a slightly opposing view to Ebola. Um, because in in his mindset, essentially, the, he sees the world as a form of, 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 of theatre. Um, hmm. He sees being human as essentially wearing a series of masks. So he, he, he wouldn't negate this idea that you can have deep-seated attachment to higher things, which Mishima certainly did. Um, but he's kind of self-consciously interested in in the obsession with ego and yeah. kind of the cult of the self. But I think because someone like Mishima is so is capable of being so egotistical and so kind of self-obsessed, while also having the intelligence to not just fall into a you know just not just become a stereotypical kind of you know um, uh, narcissistic annoyance. Yeah. 
he basically comes to the conclusion that that even the most deep, so, you know, what we would call a deep human being is there isn't actually all that much there beyond the conduit, if that makes sense. So, yeah, really, the the it's in 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 his worldview, the best you can be is a conduit for the higher thing. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, that is still a form of mask. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, this is why um, he deliberately cultivated so many aesthetics. You know, he, and he was he was obsessed with the modern press and the kind of because uh, he, I mean, he lived through the era when rather than the internet, everything was done through kind of glossy magazines. Hmm. Um, and you know, he 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 wrote these kind of wonderful incredibly well styled um novels some of the best things ever put down on paper and you know not not just in japanese literature but in world literature you know while at the same time he would he would appear as the villain in a, in a cheap gangster film you know <laughs> with his with his shirt off you know um kind of doing sort of bad acting and hammy acting while also owning a private right wing army and staging a military coup to restore the emperor sure. you know i mean there, there there's even several essays where he basically says that he doesn't consider it to be false, but his kind of right wing ultra nationalism and ultra monarchism, he he says it will at the end of the day, it is also just a form of theater. Hmm. It is, it is, it is a form of um masking, a form of costuming. Um, and he says that you know you could you could take someone that's the opposite, so you know, some sort of communist university professor. He says they're ultimately doing the same thing. The only difference is that Mishima is orienting himself towards a higher purpose. Um yeah. And the communist is orienting himself in the downwards uh, di direction. Um, so, you know, and he, and he would, he, he even, he has quite a lot of funny, funny writings on women. Um, because he, he basically said, uh, you know, I hate women. I despise the feminine mindset and the feminine it's way. Yourself. But but yeah, but, but well, yeah, he, he, he actually got married and, and had children. Um <laughs> even though he was a known homosexual, purely for the reason that he felt um, as a kind of intellectual and as a novelist, he just, he sort of had, he sort of had to know what it was like. So yeah. that he could, he could more convincingly write it. Um, and yeah. And, uh, but, and, but he wrote all these, these essays saying that he hated women, but also he admitted that he was like, he, he engaged in a lot of female behavior basically. Yeah. Um, and he said that, you know, um, and he says, like ninety percent of the people that read my books are women. So, so it's like, in in effect, I am still basically just writing for women, even though I despise them. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's what's so fascinating about a lot of these figures. I'm including Evola in this is just the the intelligence and the probity, the ability to to take things to a to such a lucid intellectual conclusion. Mm. Um, where a lot of people never get that far. They just they they don't. They're like they're like cars without engines, you know. Um, yeah. Whereas someone like uh, someone like Evola is the Apollo rocket, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I mean, the the crux of his his rigor there is just seeing how incredibly precise he is and everything he says, which is why his writing's so heavy, but. With the nature of the stuff he's talking about, he couldn't possibly risk making any mistake with it. So he just goes to mm -hmm. great pains to be as precise and ultimately crystal clear as possible. I mean, it's only crystal clear when you when you click, pretty much. Because you know, it's not a problem I have, but I've got to acknowledge the fact that a lot of people do struggle to read this stuff. Um, well, I mean, most people. I mean, this is something I. I I used to say a lot to people when, they, when you know, sort of a, a few years ago, when everyone wanted to start reading Evola. Um, yeah. And it was sort of like, well, I mean, you th there were people who had never read anything. You know, they'd never even read Plato's Republic or Machiavelli's The Prince. You know, yeah. I mean, they didn't even have the most basic education in philosophy or or, or, or literature. You know, they, they didn't even read novels, you know, regularly. You know, there was nothing... Um, there was there was not even the a modicum of, of 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 background that a reader of say 1930 would have had, um, where you know at the very least they would have had some sort of classical education. Um, the in, like any e even the most basic intellectual would have read a whole host of texts, just you know, as standard that you know even relatively well clued up people in our circles wouldn't read now. 
um, mm. or wouldn't wouldn't think they'd have to. So, I mean, you've got it. You've got that, and then on top of that, you've got the fact that if you're going to read the more esoteric stuff, mm. you you know you've got to prepare yourself a little bit, <laughs> or 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 at least be prepared to take notes and kind of look things up. Um, at, you know, to begin with the stuff, and it's not yeah. it's not something you can understand through five seconds. I mean. I think a lot of people are too conditioned to just have things delivered to them instantly now. You know, yeah. they're the, the the attention span to study with a capital S, you know, actually sit and read an author, consider every aspect of him, you know, which probably mm -hmm. it takes months, years, some people could spend a lifetime doing it. You know, they they're not really willing to do it. They would rather just look at memes <laughs> because yeah. those can be digested in a few seconds. Um well, so like as I was musing on it as to why I seem to have such an easy time of reading Evelo is acknowledging that, oh, hang on a minute, I'd had like over 20 years worth of passive intake of various things that conditioned me to be able to read it. Mm. So especially, especially with regard to the magic stuff and like that, you couldn't just possibly pick this up and get it if you didn't have at least some amount of that kind of passive feeding to set you up for it. You know, like, now talking, you know, basically being raised by a witch and having lots of schizophrenic <laughs> dreams and stuff <laughs> it definitely helps. So it always, it, whenever you say that, it always reminds me of um, this is. I'm, I'm really bringing the tone of this down now. This is a low <laughs> reference, but there's a, there's a. It's in one of the old radio shows where Carl Pilkington is talking to Ricky Gervais, and he just yeah. off and he just offhandedly says. Um, Oh yeah, in Manchester there was a woman next door whose man was a witch. <laughs> yeah. It's like what? Slow down. It, yeah. it always reminds me of that whenever you drop it in, you know. <laughs> <sighs> um, anyway, back to but, it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's a bit like um, I got, I've had more than one person like listen to a stream I did or something or, or see a mm. tweet and gone. Right, I want to start reading poetry because they've they've never they've not read it or maybe they did a few poems at G GCSE or something. And yeah. it's like, I'm, well, I, I, I tried reading T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and I didn't get it. And I did it. I'm not going to try anymore. And it's like, <laughs> no, you can't, you can't just, you can't just walk into a tall, you can't enter a tall skyscraper at floor 25. No. Unless you're, unless you've hijacked an airliner. Um, but, you know, it, it just, you've, you've got to have a sense of patience and a sense of, sort of scholarliness about the path you set yourself with these sorts of things. I mean, yeah. there are like, there are lots of good there. I mean, they, 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 I think because his style in a lot of his, in a lot of his more weighty books, I think it's, it's a little bit difficult to translate and it, and it leads to a sort of um, it's, 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 it's not the most sort of easygoing prose there is. Hmm. And so he has a bit of a reputation for being difficult to read or difficult to follow. But there's so much of his work that is completely accessible. It is, I mean, yes. But what? Meditations on the Peaks, for example. Medita Very yeah, Meditations on the Peaks. Fascism Viewed from the Right was the first ever Evola book I read, and I found it very uh, um, digestible. Yeah. Um, Eros and the Mysteries of Love is covers some really, really interesting mm -hmm. topics. Um, but... Uh, it's not a challenging book philosophically, I would say. I mean, he it's a very lucid book. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I mean, there's, I mean, the uh, Imperium and Arctos have both released things like um, Handbook for Right Wing Youth, which yeah. was which was not a book he wrote in his life. It was it, it's compiled of various essays and chapters from other things. Um, you know, and the, you know, the, these are all perfectly entry level things. I mean, you know, yeah. just you know. P people assume they can just pick up revolt of the revolt of the um, modern world, revolt against the modern world, and just you know leap in, you know when they when they've never even heard of Aristotle type thing. It's I mean they they you know it just you know treat treat the canon with with respect and understand that a re a reactionary re retrospective philosopher like Avila looking back over 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 civilization may take certain things as read. That yeah. you know, in the depths of of of, of the of the Kali Yuga, we may need to catch up on. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let's go go back on. I oh, didn't finish the point about rage. Oh, sorry. So yeah, tie that before we carry on. Um, 
So it's kind of where yoga of power comes in, where he's talking about the capacity to um, allow the passions to surface, but don't let them embed themselves into your uh, into your mind, so that you can be very deliberate in how you choose to make use of the potency they represent. So, okay, so fundamental to this is the idea that so these passions, like the particularly strong emotions, they're not actually just made from like I don't know brain wires go whir and hormones appear. It's they're actually their own metaphysical forces that surface through someone. So it's almost like if you're having a particularly heated moment, you're in a mini crisis that breaks the firmament and turns you briefly into a conduit to allow this particular vibe to spill forth. And if you if you just mm -hmm. unhinge with it, then you become well, like we've seen like schizophrenics, emotional wrecks, completely unhinged. But if, if you can actually master this and be aware of when you break through and see these passions coming out like like fish swimming around in the ocean and you can choose to grab them or sidestep them don't let them just crash into you so where where the rage becomes useful in an exceptionally higher sense is is this you you, you realize this passion and you use the potency of it and it's like it's like taking in a fucking mana potion pretty much you just, just like soak it up and then off you go and I'm assuming you've been practicing the other methods. So, well, like, so in the case of the yoga power, it's about the tantra. That's a doctrine for using it. If you're good at that, then you can do even more with it, effectively. Whereas if you just rubbish at it, then you're going to get destroyed by it. So it's sort of it's like, just... um, it's the, the classic thing of the man who's not capable of taking the initiate path and he, uh, and he gets destroyed, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, well, um, why why am I still so pro mass religion and occlusion when I dive so deeply into this stuff? It's because I'm aware that it is a very effective and very necessary protection mechanism for the masses who can't handle it. Mm. Well, yeah, because I mean, we know that we know that a society can't live without some kind of central metaphysic, yeah, which is best imparted through religion. Um, but you know, I do somewhat agree with Evola's idea that different tiers and different castes need their own variations at least on religion hmm. um, I don't really have a conclusive answer for it because um, well I mean I, I, I think it almost happens by default because I mean if we take you know sort of 12th century Italy hmm. you know the Catholicism as, as it was understood by say um, Dante Aglieri was not the same as the one that was understood by you know some peasant probably you know? no. <laughs> like there's a you know or 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 some you know um some like english herdsman i mean it it was just a, a it just 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 because certain people have access to different understandings and different variations you know some people are scholars um some people are uh some people are just sort of sim they they're more they they have a more simple understanding of faith yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting because if I think of someone like uh, Evola, who is obsessed with I don't I don't mean that in a in a, in a negative way, but he is clearly obsessed with the um, the kind of you know the most elite parts, the most patrician aspects of um, perennial wisdom and yeah. of religion in general and of metaphysics and all this sort of thing. Um, and I think of there's an aphorism by Davila, which I think perhaps is an illustration of a similar but opposing view, where he basically says, you know, because he he he's clearly an extremely well-read theologian in all religions, not not just Catholicism, um, and in spirituality and in, and in philosophy, and he says, um, when it comes down to it, my faith is the same as an old woman praying in the corner of a church. You know, he, 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 and there's quite a few where he, he, he admires the scholastics from a certain point of view, but he attacks them for turning religion into know it allism and yeah. in, in, into kind of a prescriptive uh, philosophy or an academia. I mean, again, not to um, unnecessarily kind of throw shade at people, but um, I know that, uh, so I, I, I would, I would 
describe myself as an as an unconfident Catholic, mm. in that there are still many doubts about all things in my mind, um, and still many uncertainties, um, and still many doubts and all kinds of things. Um, but I that and that's why the faith aspect is important, right? Because it because it provides an orientation towards a positive um, a positive point. Yeah. Uh, but I noticed that a lot of Protestants in particular, it's not not just Protestants, but but them in particular, will if you ask them a question or or you you put something to them, they treat it like a debating club exercise, yeah. where they will con- they will basically rather than rather than using what i would consider to be a religious attitude yeah. in dealing with kind of the mystical or the, the faith based aspect they turn it into a a a, a demonstration of rhetoric yeah. where they they prove something by by rationale um which yeah. it, it's 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 almost kind of leninist <laughs> well, that's <laughs> in you its, get in its heresy, isn't it? like yeah. antinomianism where did that come from mm. yeah it's um it's a strange um, it's a strange way to go about thinking about religion, because to me it smacks of insecurity. Um, it's completely detracts from the point of it. Well, and, and it, it also, to me, slightly sort of borders on personal heresy. Yeah. Um, because you're essentially putting you you're you're demonstrating a great pride in your own own um your own, own rationality, which in all humans is a pretty weak thing compared to divine truth, as as yeah, I understand it. it. It's like your ego is trying to make its own assertions to satisfy itself rather than yeah. opening up and accepting the, what the actual truth is. And also, I think I think to a certain extent, you, you know, there's that meme where it's the bell curve, yeah. where it's like the, the, the like five IQ at one end and 150 IQ at the other and the midway in the middle. Yeah, I, I very often think that like, you know, I, I, I see the, the top end of that and it's just like the only answer is I don't really know. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> essentially the entire universe and most of spirituality will remain a mystery and we just have to cling to it like a rock and pray for yeah. the best basically there, there isn't actually a lot we can say for certainty at all yeah it's like um, i don't really know it doesn't matter that i don't know simply that i acknowledge it and understand it and allow it to flow through yeah there is yeah, it doesn't um, matter what i think of it there what is it there is more in heaven and earth than in, exists in your philosophy horatio um, yeah in Hamlet, yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, and to to be fair, I mean, despite the fact that he spent his lifetime writing books about these things, I don't think that ever really comes across in Evola. He's he's yeah. he's not he's not a know it all. He he admits yeah. an enormous amount of vagueness. He he essentially is a kind of signpost where he's going. Look, this is the way towards a higher yeah. understanding and a higher path. He he can't pick you up and take you there. He simply points you in the in the in the in, in the right uh, direction. Yeah. Um, or if he were to say, try and bring it to you, what he'd do is just like say, "Oh, there's this land that exists. There's this higher goal. Here's a painting of it." But the painting ends up being his ego's making a manifestation of it to show you, which means it's a corrupted version of what he's trying to point at. So better just be mm-hmm. the signpost and says, "Go that way," and you'll see for yourselves. Yeah, it's um. It, it and it and it, and a, a, basically the the entire kind of um, the a, one one of the fundamental aspects of this sort of thinking is um, re- reliance on self control and the ability to push oneself hmm. um, past a certain point in that you can't you you know it's sort of you know you, you it, it's as far as I understand it correct me if I'm wrong you can't actually bring in another another being to that point you can only actually bring yourself you can't drag someone there that doesn't have the aptitude or doesn't want to go there. Um, to get to water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, although I suppose um, just sort of thinking off the top of my head, um, be interesting to, to see if there was, you had a kind of uh, reluctant prophecy moment, you know, where you, you, you have someone that for, that for whatever reason needs to be brought to it, but doesn't want to be. So you have to do all kinds of horrible tricks to, get, to try and get them. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's right. It's I, I'm thinking that purely because I um I reread the first couple of chapters of June the other week, <laughs> <laughs> where Paul Paul has to be put through all these bizarre tests, you know, yeah. to prove that he's the one. Um, yes. Um, um, 
do you have any further notes on uh, Ride the Tiger specifically? Um, so because that that is a book which contains far more wisdom than anyone ever gives it credit for. I mean, yeah. So before I jump onto the really really big thing that impedes people's ability to read it, I'll just no. point out a little paragraph that's been in front of me the entire time when you're talking about Mishima and masks. It happens to be in the end the dual aspect of amenity chapter. He talks about the origin of the term person coming from persona, which signifies masks. Yeah. And he's he's saying here, well, as he for, again, he's talking about the difference between the person and the individual, the person is someone who acts on behalf of a greater ideal, the individual is someone who acts as an atomized just unit with no reference. And he sums it up and says, I can resume and apply the ideas of a preceding chapter about the dual structure of the being. The person is that which the man presents concretely and sensibly in the world, in the position he occupies, but always signifying a form of expression and manifestation of a higher principle in which the true centre of being is to be recognised, and on which falls, or should fall, the accent of the self, self with a capital S, which leads in nicely into the big, big thing that needs to be talked about with Ride the Tiger. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. essentially what he's doing there, he's kind of, without directly saying reality is theatre, so he, he is agreeing more, more with Mishima than I think perhaps you were realising there. Mm. Well, especially because um, all societies are, and all cultures are in some way constructs, right? I mean, this, I mean, this is kind of like, <laughs> this is kind of like... Uh, uh, Derrida viewed from the right, almost. I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, but but I'm not I'm not saying that in a kind of uh, in a way to you know as, as to attack them. But all these things, even when there is kind of um, an absolute belief in them, and the kind of self doubt and self consciousness has yet to set in, there is there has to be by nature a theatricality to it. Um, yeah. hu humans are fundamentally theatrical beings. I mean, I'm, I've always been obsessed with ritual and the importance of ritual in human lives. I mean, no one has ever lived without ritual. It, it's too, yeah. it's too important in every aspect. I mean, you know, uh, we could take it, you know, from from kind of religious ceremony, um, the crowning of monarchs. All the way down to the kind of Japanese tea ceremony, you know, where you know, mm -hmm. the, the, there has to be a ritual for everything because it imbues it with a certain importance, and I think mm -hmm. speaks to the, I suppose what what you know when when it becomes extreme, we call it kind of a, um, sort of a, we call it obsessive compulsivism, right? You know, and that sort of thing. But yeah. if really, that is what's at the base of of the behavior of mankind, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, the the idea of the ritual before or during the act um as opposed to just you know um as opposed to just as opposed to just uh well, well i'm trying to think what the, what the word would be um or just acting kind of like just as a plain animal with nothing else to it yeah i suppose so yeah. well it's kind of like harkening to the whole devolution thing where it's like it's hardwired into us to know that ritual is very important because there is the whole metaphysical realm that just enriches everything we do and kind of uniquely us as humans as well. But yeah, to, well, to not do those things is to just be an animal that shut yourself off from it. Well, yes, and I mean, that's actually a very good way to put it, I think, is that um, we are um, we are kind of communing with an implicit metaphysic whenever we engage in a ritual. Yeah. Um, even if it's something as simple as a handshake. Right, yeah. it it confirms something in the mind and in the soul um, that's that it has been done correctly. You know, it's like you can't. Yeah. It's like um, you know, it's it's like in in a country like Britain, um, which has you know has spiritually ceased to exist. We still yeah. we still have the ghosts of all these really really esoteric traditions in our government and society. You know, it's like how um. Parliament cannot be considered to be in session or in any way valid if the ceremonial mace has not been brought in and placed on the uh, on the on yeah. the on the central table, right? I mean, you know, the, it it is it is an appeal to something greater, 
and this this idea that no the act is not the act is considered not to have happened unless the ritual has been satisfied beforehand yeah, yeah. Um, sorry fingers comment there just tickled me <laughs> <laughs> i raised my right arm toward the heavens and greeting someone to show the one around that's yeah. the way to do it you have to th throw a roman <laughs> <laughs> throw a Roman whenever, yeah. you, <laughs> whenever you greet someone. It's an important ritual, you know. It is, um, it is. Well, I mean, you know, in um in 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 the mid century country, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you weren't allowed to um greet a dignitary of rank without doing that. Mm. Um you know. but, but I mean really the, the, these are very, very important, even even down to tiny social codes and all the way up to you know, kind of nationwide or continent-wide observations. Yeah. yeah, well, that's one thing in the introduction to Magic series that a guy called Abraxa is very hot on, and that guy is just nuts for his ability. This is, this is one of the Ur group. Or, yeah, his yeah. ability to speak in raw magic, yeah, this, this guy is one <laughs> of them. And it, he explains very well the magic of rituals, the importance of routine, even the effect of talismans and imagery. Mm. So... If you want like the really, really hot, like pure, cure metaphysics on how that stuff works, he tells you. Right. It's so brilliantly put, but it's, yeah, yeah, I'm big enough, but I'm realizing that the language he uses is you still need the context of understanding the rest of the stuff to even get it, which is why mm. he's so effective, because he's also occluding at the same time. Um, okay. But shall we deal with the S word, the self? Yes, please go on. All right, so I'm remembering when it was first hot to read Ride the Tiger, well, actually three years ago this spring, and the hang-up that was consistent I saw was people saying, oh, what's he on about the self, what's he on about the ego and all this other stuff, and what was I, I was talking about myself. Mm. It really clicked in the very first passage in Introduction to Magic Volume 1, the editor explains that they've used the word self because of a, a translation hiccup from Italian where there wasn't actually a direct word to correspond with oh, the Italian word IO. I didn't know that. Yeah. So this ended up being quite a big feature in my speech. So I'll just, I'll just bring up my scripts for it and just read that off again. Um, okay. So where the self actually is the Italian word IO, um, it's, it's a positive alternative ego that relates to one's ability to bunny ears swim through the waters without drowning the waters mm. being um like you know, the metaphysical round the warp you know, 40k term io is a potency of affirmation of your being with capital b as an entity in your own right that if you were to re-immerse in the other metaphysical plane that we came from before manifesting you wouldn't dissolve back into the primordial condition before you were formed like you wouldn't just return back into raw chaos stuff before yeah. you know, what your soul came from. So whilst the ego can create a hard case that shields you from the, this potential corrosion, Io gives you the condition to immerse and thus make contact with rather than separate from the waters. So if you've got a really strong ego, you can assert yourself as existing in real space terms, but you can't do anything with the metaphysical stuff because you, you're blocking yourself off of it. It's like putting up a shield. So whilst you're protected mm. from it, you can't use it either. Whereas Io is like, you've got gills, you've got second lenses on your eyes, you can actually just swim in this stuff and be immersed in the magic and just do it. And right. there's, a, there's a, um, so I ended up diving into the um, the Odyssey, actually. There's a little scene in that that kind of explains a bit more about what, what it is and how it's applying. So um, we take the Odyssey as a parable for the spiritual quest mm. so in this particular scene um so odysseus is given a magical sash by the goddess lucatho yeah. sometimes also called io whilst he's cast away in the frothing sea on his way to the Phaeacian coast he's on a raft mm -hmm. and it, it gives him the strength to swim and breathe despite poseidon's efforts at churning up the waters casting a storm to try and well, smite him yeah so in the very same scene, Odysseus obstinately clings to his raft, even after Lucatho gives him the sash. He's representing he's holding on to his ego, he doesn't want to let go of it. Okay. 
um, there's a there's a really critical point in say the alchemical work or the black work where you have to kill the ego. And here he is. He says he's distrusting Lucatho despite being given the sash. He's holding onto his ego because he's kind of, the scared animal is kicking in there. He says, "I shall stay with my wrath for the moment. I shall do what I myself thinks best. As long as the joints of plank hold fast, I will stay where I am and endure the suffering." And yet, in the same train of thought, he has to. Even though he has no need of it. Right? Yeah. Wait. He, he thinks he needs it. Yeah. And that's where the animal's in. But once he gets past it. He's like, oh, the sea is eventually going to destroy the raft. It's breaking apart, and Poseidon's having his way, and he has to eventually let go of it and just trust that he has a strong enough IO to swim, and he does. He's able to swim despite the ocean currents and the winds and the waves and manages to get to the, the Phaeacian coast and lands on the beach. Hmm. It's only because he had the empowered IO was represented by the goddess Lugatho. It's kind of it's showing that once a man has shown himself worthy and capable, the, the divines will impart unto him the special ability. And there he goes, he's fine. But he has to trust it as well. It's kind of like, he gets to a point where he has to take a leap of faith and go, right, I think I'm good enough now. And then you start making communion, like, it, it's, it's affirmed and you've got it. So it's a kind of principle of detachment, um, if you like. Mm, you're not wrong, but I'd say that's not quite heading in the right vein. Okay. What would be a more apt um, description? Uh, so, okay, think of Morrowind, right? How well do you know Morrowind? The other scrolls will. I, I don't know it. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> really so, okay, some people in here might know that. So they, they know the um, difference between Vivek and Dagoth there, right? So Vivek is a guy who has realized that the dream of Nern is a thing, but he still exists despite of it. Whereas Dagoth has convinced himself that he's actually the dreamer and everything's a simulation from him. So Vivek's got a colossal IO where he just can exist despite anything. And it means that he is kind of realizing as an ultimate being with a capital B. Mm. Whereas Dagoth is kind of just dissolving himself into being nothing as well. It's like, well, I'm just a project of simulation as well. It's just, ugh, what's the point? Because an ultimate nihilist. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, where else do I... I can talk about it. Mm. Yeah, it, it's... Um, yeah, it's not like, it's not a full-blown detachment. You have to kill your ego. Well, kill with bunny ears. It's would it would it be you, you have to subjugate the ego in that you can't ever really get rid of it as such, but you just have to gain control over it. You have to gain mastery over it, or would that mastery is the explicit word I'd have to use for this, right? So, I mean, whilst you're still existing on Earth in real space, you kind of need to use the ego because it's it's intrinsically tied to presence being maintained in real space. Yeah. And okay. It, especially with reference to other people and the winds and currents that come off them, it, having a strong ego means that you're less likely to get buffeted by the winds of other people or other things. So you can kind of create. It's almost like making a shelter in a in a windy plane that like you can't mm. really do a lot when the wind's blowing all the time. It's drives you nuts. But if you can make a little shelter, you kind of focus a bit more on the internals and the inside and work on the inner mission to achieve the realization of the io and everything else i quite like this conception of the the ego is shelter yeah the idea it's yeah a, yeah it's a protective case but it can be far too protecting to the point of blanking you out of the metaphysical plane you fall into your own plato's cave at that point don't you i mean you yeah, yeah. you just become yeah. too wrapped up in it you can't yeah. see what's actually going on yeah okay um, it's um it's, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure why it puts me in mind of, um, I was reading an essay by um, Jorge Luis Borges, mm. who was talking about sort of existential matters. And he, he remembered an old parable um, in which there was a Chinese scholar in the 10th century, I think, who, who woke up from a dream that he had in which he was a butterfly. Mm. And he suddenly couldn't, 
he had a bit of an existential crisis because he didn't know whether he was a man who dreamed about, about being a butterfly or a butterfly who was having a dream about being a man all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that so th there's a little bit of a, a little thing to catch on to there. So um, there's something else that gets explained in some of his works. I ended up explaining it with reference to 40k Titan Cruise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it's like tangent, but um, so in, in this book, I was referencing Titanicus by Dan Abner. There's a case there where you've got someone who has not a strong enough IO and someone with too strong an ego. Right. So the guy with too weak an IO, he suffers um, phantasms and visions of ghosts. He gets tormented by the nascent spirits that are so strongly tied to his Titan that he's working with. So, so okay, so relating to Titan, something like, just like a, a culture or a church, something that has an egregore attached to it, yeah. is if your IO is not strong enough, you'll be kind of at the mercy of the, the non-physical spirits that are still attached to it, almost like haunting it. Um, mm -hmm. Haunting's not quite the right word, because that's kind of something else, but it, it's the it's the magical metaphysical potency that's still tied to an object that if your eye is not strong enough, but you still break into the waters, then this stuff will just have its way with you and it'll kind of use you to um, cause re-exertions back in real space where they can't anymore. Right. Yeah, so the, this guy basically just goes nuts because <laughs> um, he just can't handle it. So, I mean, it's sort of tangentially um, related, but this is something of a segue. But I want to ask you about essentially taking a meta look on all of this and talking about the concept of certainty or surety yeah. in these things, because I had a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago who is a quite clever, but they're a, they're a convinced materialist yeah. um, in that they, anything that goes beyond um, essentially their empirical material world, they see as just woo, right? They do, they, 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 they see it as, they, they 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 take they take the view that it's all about kind of a big comfort blanket. Um, so they they take the view that all religions, all spiritualism, anything that invokes the non-material is just woo um, yeah. by by default. You know, it's not 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 necessarily malignant, but just they will not admit there's anything beyond that, uh, beyond the material. Um, and. Well, I sort of answered my own question, really, because, of course, that takes to, to just as much um, certainty as it does to, you know, to someone like Evola, who is communing with this kind of um, eternal wisdom. Um, Audial truth, that, a capital P and a capital T, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so where in your mind does the... Um, does the beginnings of that certainty in the, in the primordial truth actually begin? Um, do you think essentially that it's, you know, a, a more conventional answer might be related to personality type? Um, you know, where does the, like, is, is, is it a matter of just accepting, um, you know, wh where does the ability to use it as a basis philosophically actually come from? So, and do you, do, do you think it's the same sort of, uh, Kierkegaardian leap of faith, um, that, that, that you know, that a, a normal person need, needs to go through to believe in a religion. So, so I'm gonna, I could add twinge on Poe's talk at the first event. Where he says you just got to keep going until the priest touches you and you vibe. <laughs> Paraphrasing quite heavily, <laughs> but yeah, to get an actual genuine affirmation with the capital A, you have to have the crisis moment that Evel talks about at the end of Ride the Tiger. Mm. It's like a, it's like a light turning on. It, it just is. It, something clicks, and mm -hmm. suddenly you have the sixth sense. You can dive into these waters. You can feel it. You can vibe it. And once you can do that, and you start paying attention to it, rather than the kind of well, okay, so you got to first deal with the animal in you like, and the ego trying to go, oh, that's a scary. I don't like it, and trying to block you out of it. Yeah, you kind of got to see the animal in you as being like the big red dragon in the cave. It, it's it's an enemy to the soul. So you've got to deal with it. And once you get that to shut up, you've subjugated it, 
you've mastered it, you can then successfully vibe <laughs> and you can feel it. It's completely mm. real. It's, it's a whole extra sensation that it, it kind of has a musical tonality to it. Right. And this is so. Okay, okay. Okay. So Tolkien's very on point with his the background story for the, the genesis of the universe and his setting with the the song of the Aina. Is it the metaphysical realm is very musical in how it yeah. just makes things appear and form and it, it's all currents. But yeah, once you've had the crisis, once you split the shell of the ego and the nice creamy yolk of the io can spill out, it can go and blend into the waters and take on the tinctures of it and it will just feel it and understand it and it's like the rapidity of knowledge intake from this is it can be like a dozen things instantaneously or things that you find that you've already known ahead of the time that it's taken to process it consciously okay so one, let's say once you caught the wind in your sails you know they're there before you've looked up and gone ah there is wind in my sails you're already moving hmm. so yeah all i have to say to the those that are still stuck in material is like just just make the lights turn on and then you'll feel it like once okay. it's there you know it's there and you couldn't possibly mistake it for anything else so with the example of the denialist i gave you um is that not a kind of inverted um a kind of inverted vibe if you will yeah in that it's a it makes complete sense to them um but it just involves a sen because it's interesting because of course a, a perennialist is not a denialist they have they don't deny the material world they they <laughs> engage in it they fully understand it um they're able to work and think on that level um yeah. they just say okay but you know that that's that's the base floor and there's you know many hundreds of layers above it um yeah. whereas the materialist just goes no it's not there yeah, no, it's um, like saying the back rooms don't exist. It's like, well, it's the door right there. <laughs> I mean, is it, um, is it essentially a kind of, because eventually you get to a sort of logical fallacy where it's sort of like, well, does something exist when I'm not looking at it? Yeah. It's like, right. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Abergavenny. Does Brecon exist when I'm not there? Yeah. <laughs> does it, does it cease to exist when I leave and then exist again when I come back? But to, to be fair, certain philosophical schools which have valid ideas would say that that is actually not a stupid argument um yeah from an, ego, from, an ego, from an egocentric point point of view yeah it's like when i read um schrodinger's cat when i was a sixth form it's like yeah, there's it's, a little thought experiment you mentioned where how quantum mechanics change depending on if a person is observing it mm -hmm. And it is the whole thing where you couldn't possibly be sure that anything outside of your vision is actually correctly manifested. Yeah. Object permanence, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I suppose we're kind of applying, um, applying the, the wrong ends of the wire here, but uh, I'm, I'm, I am just kind of um, thinking out loud now, just with, you know, can you apply that type of logic to, perennial thinking in sort of you know because no, it, well, yeah because because it's, that, perennial, the, it's always there yeah exactly it's yeah. a it's a con contradiction in terms isn't it um yeah mm. but um so again on the, the materialist he kind of has to he has to first accept that yes it does exist to then be able to allow himself to tune into it when it does make itself apparent otherwise you just keep denying it and go what was that i'll try and explain it with science mm. i mean for reference like i mean like i can be like schizophrenic wizard but i'm also an engineer on my day trade yeah i've got to use physics to do my job i remember um being at school um secretary school and for several years there was a biology teacher who was a an Anglican priest, um, who was also the school chaplain. Um, and he was also a, a PhD biologist. Hmm. Um, and of course, because you know, I mean I didn't I didn't really have any background in faith and a lot of my reading was just kind of really surface level sort of um, magazine intellectualism and sort of you know Christopher Hitchens and that sort of thing. So this was like a massive contradiction in terms to me, you know, as as it was to many hmm. people. 
you know, it was like, but how can you be science and religion at the same time? You know, mm -hmm. um, very idiotic thinking. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, this this is why a lot of the um, I mean, I mean, for example, the great magisterium of the Catholic Church, the perennialists, it's they seem to have so much more truth you know, mm. kind of literally perennial truth to impart of the, you know, in, in a, in the, in the most basic sense of what philosophy is in that yeah. it's an attempt to work out the truth of the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they seem to have a better chance with it because they're not, they're not denying anything. Yeah. You know, they, they take the world as it is given on its material level and also its metaphysical level. Um, yeah. They're basically willing to observe things that many people just aren't willing to, even though it seems to be right there, you know, observes them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's 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 something that it's something that is, I mean, really, you could spend multiple lifetimes um, even on the most basic aspects of it, couldn't you? You know, I mean, it's actually slightly confusing to me that that Western philosophy has taken such an anti-perennial stance, um, more or less kind of since the Enlightenment. Um, because, I mean, I would, I mean, some would disagree with this categorization, but to me, let's say, like, Christianity, especially Catholicism, is kind of perennialism by default hmm. because, it's, um, because it's a system that admits an eternal, all-knowing, omnipresent God um, and includes in that basic aspects of truth about the world yeah um but then as soon as you deviate from that and you begin to run into secular humanist philosophy mm. all of a sudden you get wrapped up in all this kind of uh very well as i said humanist very man-centric um what to me just seems to be nonsense and, and yeah you just get into autistic theology arguments around the rosary brush yeah and they wrap themselves up in circles i mean you know philosophy from kind of Descartes to Zizek. I mean, it's yeah. there really isn't a great amount of uh, of of profound profundity there. I mean, you can basically, you know, you can fish out the ones you like, like Schopenhauer or Kierkegaard or whatever. Um, but that, but it, it it's just it just it's amazing to me that it went so far off the deep end into pure confusion, um, so quickly and for so long. Well, so that. Because you've mentioned the since the Enlightenment stuff, so I mean, this is quite a, a good moment to bring up the essay on the counter initiation. Yes. So that's in that's in the first volume of Introduction to Magic. It's under the name of Arvo, which sometimes is and sometimes isn't Evola. Again, as I said at the start of the book, it doesn't matter who they are, just what they say. But the um, to the counter initiation is saying that basically masons and saying that they're acknowledging that many people will naturally come to a crisis in their lives where they where the lights try and turn on mm. with where they kind of breach the firmament and it's saying that what these organizations have done or not even organizations but actual like full-blown nasty entities on the other side have decided to try and sweep these people up so they set up counter initiations to confuse people to stop them actually realizing what's going on to keep them firmly in the material cage. Yeah, I'm going on a massive gnostic tangent now, but um, it's essentially just saying that many people, like so many people, could get onto this, and if they'd only perhaps stay a little bit true to the fundamentals of the church, the rituals, the, the actual, the really pure vibe stuff. Mm. at the depths of it below all of the, the theological nonsense on top that just con confuses it they might still stay true to it they wouldn't necessarily go very far but they wouldn't have to they still mm. be safely kind of well, in tune to the primordial truth of it um i guess it's kind of their helpful of reference as well the, the premise that so yeah not everyone can realize the primordial truth some people just can't and so there's a there's a classification of three different types of spirit that's it's in the gnostic stuff it's also in the hindu stuff you've got mm. um tamas satras and viryas and you, um that's the hindu terms and in the gnostic terms you've got cyclic psychics and pneumatics 
Right. So high clicks are like, I kind of feel like it's about 20% of people. They are just animals. They yeah. are inert. <laughs> they cannot vibe. They've basically got no soul N in them. NPC fixed dialogue, you know. Completely. Just, yeah. there is, they're just clay automatons, like gods. Mm-hmm. They don't, the they, don't, they don't have any inner monologue. They can't actually, they can't yeah. actually conceive of they. They can't actually conceive of thoughts in a two dimensional way. Basically, no. You see those eyes, and there's nothing in them. They can't. The they can't put. Co they can. Story. They can only. They can only think in. They can only think idiomatically. Yeah. They just. They just apply pre like like cardboard pre programming, and that's the yeah absolutely that's their life. yeah yeah. So they they they, they don't even be bug men. They just mm -hmm. they just that. They are the sacks of potatoes in the uh, yeah. Bowden analogy. They're just yes. there for there for better people to move move around. Yeah. yeah. So you've got them, and then you've got the psychics, which I'd argue is seventy nine point nine percent of people, right? Of varying grades, but that's essentially the person who they've got a soul, they can vibe, but for them. They need to have the organized religion. They need to be the ones waiting for salvation. They need to be the ones that follow Jesus' teachings to stay safe. Right. Because they can vibe, but they ain't got the IO to survive breaking out. So they're intelligent people, capable, but they're not going to be an apostle. You know, they're yeah, from... they can be your clergy, they can be your bishops, they can yeah. be your reverends, they can be the average person on the street that is just pious. Okay. Or can be just someone who's just, you know, kind of, kind of a bit spiritual. But they're also the massive fertile ground for the force of the counter initiation to sweep up. Yeah. But the bit they like to focus on the most is the last little tiny percentage, which is just the pneumatics, which is the people who can break out and can see what's going on and can complete the spiritual quest. Right. Um, I like to think of Blood Meridian as a good analogy of that. Of, mm the kid who is a, so he's one of these pneumatics and he sees what's going on and he starts encountering the universal laws trying to bat him away from completing the quest yeah but the, he's, um, he's, uh, he's oddly very passive yeah mm. um so you know the gnostic term is the archons of these great prison guards that try and force us to stay down here and people like the judge are such archons and and the guy's ex explained as being like this weirdly alien looking guy that just seems to know far too much and just has mm -hmm. this weird power to him. Yeah. Because he's kind of just like, most of the time he's messing with this guy. He's messing with the kid. He's entertained by it, but he knows he's going to smash him right at the end because mm -hmm. the kid just hasn't quite got it. So, um, yeah, the, the people who are kind of the cleanest and truest of souls, the best nomad souls, can do this, like the Grail Knights. But as we know, the Grail Knights, only very few of them achieve the victory. You've got Bors, Percival, and... Um... That's up. Mm. There's three of them anyway. Um, yeah. But all the rest of them, they don't. They don't achieve it. But all of the Grail Knights are of the sort that could. But for whatever reason, they fail in different ways, and only some of them manage it. Again, okay. it's like the addicts, but... And then the other horrible side of it is you've got some that um, go bad. And this is where you get the usual uh, disdain towards Gnostic stuff, where you get the guys who aren't, aren't the Christian sort. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, I'm going to become my own Archon, effectively. They're like, I'm going to master the magic in the Woo, and I'm going to use it to dominate the Earth. So they're going to use it to, rather than fully ascend and go you know, go to like the kingdom of Prestige on again, like now nah, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to dick around with everyone else. So that is your kind of judge Holden, if you like. Yeah. Someone with immense understanding and power, but yeah. who is, but who is basically just kind of um, at ease with it as opposed to, they're not particularly ambitious. But this is bad. Like. It's evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, so it's kind of, um, like a, almost like a self-denying nihilism via the ego, if that makes sense. No, it's not. <laughs> no. No, it's, it's, a, it's a full comprehensive realization of the fully initialized spirit, well, the soul is its highest achievement, and then turning it back on the world, doing a full inversion of what it's supposed to be doing. So it's not like you're not going to return to communion with God. You're just going to 
um, instead stay down here in this strange material realm that fitting you ash shouldn't exist again heresies right. but it's um yeah, i'm kind of gonna get stuck here unless i bring up okay do you remember the two images i showed of the cosmology diagram yes yeah so i had the nice one and i had the inverted one so um you've got let's see I'll just share it with you quickly to help you remind. You might I can, want to put... I can, I can bring it up on stream. Um... You might be able to do that, actually. Uh... I'm just going to tank the bandwidth while I'm doing this, so bear with. <laughs> actually, they're not that big. Uh... Okay, right. I'll see if I can get these on the stream. Um, anyway, yes, do go on while I'm doing that. Um. Yeah, okay, so um, let's just move the windows around. All right, so in a happy, naturally ordered universe, the, the cosmos is behaving as it should according to God's structure and how he wants things to flow. You have him right. in his perfect realm in the center and the motion of the spirit is from the raw essence of chaos that coalesces and turns into vibrant earthly appearances and humans and the wonderful beauty that is creation and you have the teachings of the sun and the um the rest of the well the plenum where the they're kind of there to teach that yeah there's this order god's at the top here's the process but there's a nice flow to it. Everything kind of spins and it works, and it's it's got the cycle of rebirth and regeneration and death, and it's it's keeping fresh and alive. Whereas the forces of the counter initiation, they want to assert the inversion of this, where everything becomes the ultimate prison. Everything okay. is stagnation. So, um, <clears throat> oh, get the images up. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not letting me share them. Unfortunately, it needs to be like uploaded as a. Google Slides thing, um, which I Ugh. really can't be bothered to do. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, um, I can, I can, I can link to descriptions in the. I can link to the images in the description. Um, yeah, do that for the, for people who are watching this in the future. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, I'll just describe the image then. So we've got the greater shell of the cosmos, and you've got the layer of chaos, primordial spirit, holy spirit, the earthy plane, the firmament, his perfect realm, and God at the top. So outside of the cosmos is the void. Um, so we're not talking like the realm of the devil or anything. We're talking like really disturbing, chthonic stuff that's, as Tolkien describes in the Song of the Iron Air, it's weird, um, like the Watcher in the Dark and what that is and everything else like him is. It's the things created from the slight discord, like the slightly wrong note struck in the orchestra of the Iron Air mm -hmm. that makes these things appear that shouldn't really be there and they're outside of the um the great plan right but yeah so you've got the shell of the cosmos outside of it is dispersion inside of it in the first layer is disillusion which leads to fixation in the earthly plane which leads to stability in this perfect realm and ultimately god at the top yeah inward, inward to the center of god is the process of order outward to be on the shell of the cosmos is entropy in the inverted cosmology, you've got um, the shell of the cosmos on the outside still. Dispersion is still on the outside in the void, but then the inner goes to stagnation. And you have the wall of the archons, and inside of that wall is the earthly prison, mm -hmm. which is the stage of ossification up against the boundaries of Tartarus, which is yeah, it's the prison as far below hell as hell is below the earth. It's the actual utter depths of it. Mm -hmm. And in that you have paralysis and ultimately the center is nil, the complete antipole nothingness. But the, um, the order in this case, it still flows inward, but it's order through utterly nothingness. Okay. There's nothing left to be chaotic. The, it's just, it's just it's nothing. It all ceases like turbo ultimate nihilism. 
So the counter initiation stuff wants to disrupt the natural flow according to God's plan and insert, instead assert the prison condition mm -hmm. where nothing flows anymore. It's like pneumatics can't go anywhere and psychics are purely cattle to be reaped. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty um, disturbing when you factor in as well the um, where the Saturnine legends go from like the old Roman cults and Saturn supposedly being the god of the golden age, but he was actually cast down by Jupiter onto Earth and he ends up ruling Earth instead. Yeah. It's also the um, representation of like, the harvest and death. <laughs> so, of course, because, well, I suppose traditionally there's this idea that um, kind of cavorting with satanic uh, figures um, mm. or an engagement with kind of the abyss um, is obviously negative, but it also grants certain abilities yeah. that you may not get elsewhere. Do you believe that to be actually true or is that just kind of a trope in in fiction and, and in kind of mythos? Mm, no, I find it to be the case. Um, so, okay. Yeah. There's some very creepy people you might unfortunately encounter that use it. That is your kind of left hand path, I suppose, isn't it? No. Um left hand and right hand path is better described as the wet and the dry path. Right. So again, this is something that all the air guys and Neville talk about quite a lot. Um the Tantra stuff is specifically wet, a wet path process in that mm -hmm. it's that's all about mastery of the passions and making use of the the natural primordial potency of things, whereas yeah. the dry path is very much focused on the willpower of the person doing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what reason does someone then have to kind of deliberately venture into the abyss? Um, given that, I mean, sh because surely it must be in some way costly or destroying. Yeah, um, the, the ultimate forfeit. Inevitably. Yeah. Forfeit in the name of what? Just a particular type of power or understanding or knowledge? Well, it's just like, it's another way out, but it's just, it's not going to go anywhere good. So, so then, um, sorry. you'll have, I guess, the realizations of the metaphysical plane and what you can do with it. And you, if you go down that way, you effectively get a route of, vampirism and being a just complete black hole that sucks the goodness out of everything it's around. Right. Um, yeah, if you encounter someone like that, they're just fundamentally disturbing to be near and you might not necessarily know why. But these are the same people that would then decide that they don't actually understand art and they don't feel anything transcendental at all. They are completely and utterly shut off from God at that point. And they are nothing but a disturbing black hole that they've just fallen into the crypt as it were yeah they're, they're done um, okay but they're kind of yeah the, the ultimate anti pneumatic in that case mm. and god forbid they actually fully realize what they're capable of slightly um this reminds me somewhat of uh kurt at the end of um apocalypse now or uh heart of darkness just like <laughs> this this idea that they're completely enclosed in their own madness they've, yeah. they've just gone off the edge and they they you can't bring them back you know um, yeah they, they do just become a black hole <laughs> mr mr kurtz he dead you know? yeah um Dumped. so so do, so do, do you recall any particular writing from Evola on this aspect um of the abyss and kind of the the, the darker parts um in this understanding so there's a few places where he talks about it in the mystery of the grail when he goes on the end about the masons and what happens with the gelts and ghibellines mm. so there he's touching on like the mysterious happening in about 1328 where the whole stage has changed like all of these up and coming emergences of perennial mythology just disappear the templars get taken out the, the gelts win and the catholic church forever changes mm -hmm. And they end up with a very long quiet spell where not a lot happens until someone like Christian Rosenkritz comes up and the other alchemists in um, the early Renaissance. Yeah. And then something happens around the time of the, the Enlightenment and they go under the radar again and they just disappear. 
and then we all know what's happened since the enlightenment. Mm. So in Evola's conception, is he mm. essentially that the the gib the the Gibbelines are trying to save the church from itself? Um and that the church doomed itself by basically the Guelph powers winning or or was Pretty it just much, kind of yeah. entropic corruption, per se? Well, so um yeah, sort of <laughs> It's like come up to the surface rare at this point. So um yeah, back to the realm of sensible writing. So fundamental to the Ghibelline stuff is the divine monarch at the top. Mm -hmm. So you've got the church, you've got the state, and the king's on top and he deals with both of them. Whereas the, the Gelf one's kinda of like, well, the church runs everything more or less. Um I'm paraphrasing massively. I know um, yeah. I know someone that knows more on the history of it. But essentially the Ghibelline stuff plays most true to what Evola is for, in that you have the monarch who is a divinely recognized soul who is the ultimate pontifex. So he is mm -hmm. the chief conduit to the divine truths. Yeah. And it's through him and him being no longer the man who became the king, but avatar of kingship. Doesn't matter who the guy was, he, he's no longer that man anymore. Effectively, the, the man as we knew him was dead if he fully realized his role as the king, as the pontifex. Okay. Yeah, so this is a guy who has the ultimate realization above the personality. And, and it, this this boils over into, if I'm not mistaken, the conflict between Evola and Gwenon. Mm -hmm. Um, because as I'm a, as I understand it, Evola was a kind of um hardcore Ghibelline. Um, yeah. uh, whereas Gwenon supported the kind of um, Brahmin style rule where the, pri the priestly caste rules everything, which is obviously far more, um, far better expressed in kind of Guelphism. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I know that they did feud over that a bit, didn't they? Yeah. Well, um, Evola's argument is in, um, in the state of disillusions between ages, it's the stage preceding the priestly caste taking over that's the best one that's got the ultimate king on top and it's mm. when things start going downhill it's when the priests then take over and then after that you have the stage of the managerial and then what we got now yeah yeah um someone yeah. in the chat by the way sorry to, just to go back slightly oh, yeah. they're asked they're saying they've just read morgoth's uh substack essay on jimmy savile's evil wizardry Ugh. um i mean i actually I, I we are backtracking a bit but yeah, if you I remember right i I, I sent you that, that that video someone made where they pointed out a bunch of things. Yeah, it's really that creepy. He was the seventh son of a seventh son. Yeah. Which I understand has major implications. Yeah. Um, he was also born on uh, in Leeds, which lies across one of the, the old hell lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's considered to be a hell gate in traditional uh, English mythos, isn't it? Leeds. Um, <laughs> yeah, of all places. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, so can you basically like groom somebody from before their birth to be set up for certain paths when it comes to the magic aspects of life? Um, yeah, this is, so this is kind of, um, do you remember when I shared that essay on, so it was actually one written by Ebola, um, mm. or aristocracy in the initiatic tradition. Yes. And um, I kind of, so, yeah, Rupert had a fantastic point, and in a little bit of my response to it, I said how the bit that's kind of missing from the essay, and it's kind of it's a presumption on part, is that you're acknowledging the existence of the astrological courts, and mm -hmm. the wizards trying to ordain the perfect time for the king and queen to conceive their son. Yes. Yeah, so it's like, so f more fundamental to that is the idea that with a genuine king with a capital K, the soul of the man appropriate to become that doesn't really have to come from explicit lineage as much as the blood seriously helps. And it's a massive benefit if it is there, but more that the soul can kind of just be plucked out of the other as the right kind for the job. Mm. And you can basically use these the wizards to make it happen or make it most likely to happen. Yeah. And if not, it's the will of the God 
Yeah, God, yeah, the will of God that it should happen when it does. I mean, he did. He did seem to be a kind of court astrologer um, to to the regime, essentially. Um, I mean, he was uh, he was apparently the only person who was waved through the security gates at um, Buckingham Palace. Like he had oh. keys to the place, you know. Yeah. Um, he was constantly being called in there for unknown reasons. Yeah. Um, I mean, is he's just kind of like this sort of horrible dark mage figure yeah. <laughs> with supernatural powers that was being called in by the elite to fix stuff for them. I mean, we talk you talk about um uh Judge Holden with yeah. his kind of sort of uh um easygoing, sort of creepy creepy mastery of everything. Yeah. I suppose you could read the same sort of energy into Savile, right? Because he 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 had that sort of um really laid back like happy go lucky mm. like i'm so evil i'm a complete bastard <laughs> and no one is going to stop me doing this no one yeah. is going to put no one can ever temper what i'm doing yeah um, too much got like that you yeah. know it does it does i mean you know and it, and it's because there are so many odd signs before his birth that essentially <laughs> it's like the it's the, 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 essence, the <laughs> yeah the the essence is there before the material um before the material appearance you know yeah it's like something wanted him to appear on earth yeah <laughs> something i mean he also happen. he also had like weird powers when it came to music mm. i mean jimmy savile invented djing do you know that like he he invented turntablism that was li literally he, he came up with it like it yeah. was he he that's how he got started he ran all these dance clubs for the youth all over the north he, he built up like an empire of clubs yeah um because he basically invented like you know on the spot scratching of records and like remixing and all this stuff i mean which obviously was like kind of tr it's i mean trance like isn't it yeah like it was literally kind of putting the youth into this great trance you know where they'd all be like cr like running in there in huge crowds to go and listen to these insane gigs you know yeah. um well it, it kind of relates to one of the most entertaining chapters in my the tiger on the question of jazz mm. yes now this is a this is a much discussed um, chapter um, in yeah. this circle. There's been quite a lot of ink spilled and um, ar argument made over this. But um, anyway, do do introduce us to this. All right. So the crux of his argument against jazz. I mean, he's talking a lot about the um, the development of the musical scene up until I mean, we were talking about the mid '60s at this point. Mm -hmm. um, jazz kind of exploded in the '20s. Yeah, with the the weird, creepy concurrences with some of the Art Deco stuff and the French lodges and the uh, rabbit hole, um, but effectively, jazz is up against the very finest classical music, like the grandest compositions that kind of play really true to some pretty hard, beautiful maths in tonality scales that you have on the other side jazz appearing and likewise where it's um very kind of staccato rhythmic and it's designed to be a bit discordant to the point where he just straight up says it's basically like negro music because it's designed to elicit like losing yourself in it into this weird yeah like, frenzy and he said yes. it yeah he said like the rhythm and the beats in this stuff is very similar to this tribal stuff in rituals around the fire, making people froth and have like you know, the, the voodoo lower mm. come into them and start prancing around in someone's body. Mm. It's like a it's like music that can make a person lower their defenses immediately. You know? Yeah, mm. uh, yeah, straight up. So. Um, it ties in quite well what he talks about with the new spiritualist stuff being complete riffraff and distraction because it that kind of is like a, a kind of initiation light where it's it's just fully just spaffing people into a whole load of like nonsense where they're not going to get anywhere whereas otherwise they might have been able to and i was thinking about the jazz stuff a bit earlier because i'm thinking well yeah that took that took precedence for quite a while but nowadays the main thing that's really driving mainstream music is exceptionally algorithmic stuff. Yeah. So like slop. It's like Ed Sheeran uses barely any chords. Yeah. The chords he does use are kind of almost like on one hand you could say scientifically proves to be most pleasing to the plebeian mind. 
on the really schizophrenic side of it, you could say that they're all like little chime spells to like enrapture people. Well, because it, it is odd. They've basically got it down. I think I think you know from kind of the mid two thousands onwards, they got the perfect formula for yeah. just keeping the normies completely entranced. Think about anything you ever listen to, like a club in Ibiza, it's like yeah. it's going to be that kind of. Like, so again, like you can produce it really quick because you just follow an algorithm, and you just like shovelware being spat out, and you just soak it up. Um, mm. God, even on my own beloved industrial scene, like Covenant does it. And it's mm. just kind of listening to it, and like you're really listening to it, you realize, well, this is just, eh, <laughs> this isn't music. There's isn't. There's nothing higher in this. It's completely base. Apparently, according to my pe parents, when I was very, very young, like a baby, if they put the radio on and it was pop, I would just start crying. <laughs> <laughs> I just like like furiously. I, apparently, I've never been able to tolerate pop music and just like radio yeah. slop ever. Um, yeah, there's something deliberately irritating about how it's supposed to literally just worm a hook into your brain. I hate it. I hate it. And it just sounds. It's so, it's it, the inanity of it. I mean, yeah. I don't mind the occasional like stupid catchy tune. Um, yeah. And I should say, I am actually a really big fan of like traditional jazz, like trad jazz. Oh, so so like, right. I've, always, I've always been like a massive nerd, like a trad jazz nerd. Yeah. Um, wow. So, so I don't know, but yeah, it's just I can't I, I can't stand that stuff, and I don't understand how people, people why, why they put up with it. I mean, like I went like I I, when, when I lived in Cardiff, hmm. um. I used to like to write in cafes because, you know, it's yeah. a nice place to sit. You've got a nice bit of activity around you. You know, it's easier to concentrate, actually, um, than when you just sat on your own. Yeah. Well, yeah, but then they all just had Radio 1 on, just blaring, really. Oh, I just yeah. couldn't stand it. It was toxic. It used to drive me out the door, like, fleeing, literally. Yeah, it's like... Yeah. It's literally designed to, to stop you being able to think. It just floods all of oh, your thought space. And it's, it's so frustrating. I would I would find it easier to write with someone beating me with a cane yeah. than if they just put Radio One on. It would genuinely be just concentrate. Completely dominates your concentration, and yeah. it's just like you're always fighting it to try and break through with it. It's horrific. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, what better thing to flood the minds of the masses with is stop so them just thinking about what they're doing? Nay, and it doesn't yeah. amount to it. It's like it. It's like food that is like anti-nutritional. It's not lit. It's not yeah. poisonous per se. There's just yeah. nothing in it. it; just makes you feel ill, you know. Goyslop. Yeah, exactly. It's the goyslop yeah. of, of sound. It's awful. So, yeah, um, so like, so in that respect, sort of able to see, basically able to speak sixty years on to whatever they're saying with the jazz question. It's like we're kind of liking jazz now, kind of the same as like the late, the late Victorian neo spiritualist movement, or even like the um, uh, Ruskin's Boys and all that school of painting. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, ah, I'm not sure I remember it. Anyway, the stuff they're vibing onto is after a period of having just innate stuff that's kind of really mundane, it kind of has to resurface because people have this little subtle crisis where the spirit goes, eh, I need this. Where is it? I'm going to make it. Mm. So kind of like we're getting this now with jazz being in the fore because like, we know it's a vibe. The problem with jazz on mass is like, yeah, you end up with a, a chaotic condition for the masses. Whereas now, what we've ended up with is, as I said, with the it, it's music that plays straight into the the prison cosmology. It's like mm -hmm. it, it it is just designed to shut people off. Yeah, and it, it's really ordered in the way it's super order in how it does it, but it's the inversion of the ideal order. Well, I mean, do you know about all the really dark shit that um, Theodore Adorno uh, got up to in regards to this? No. So he was a he was a musicologist by training, and um, mm. he he detested mass culture, and um, and kind of you know sort of cultural slop that was being served out to the masses. Um, but he was also like a, a member of the Frankfurt School, yeah. and he wrote a lot of like you know sort of Marxist adjacent um, cultural theory. Um, a member of the tribe, I believe, and um, uh, he so there's this. There's this like ongoing like conspiracy deep lore about him being involved with the Beatles because it's, it's uh, essentially okay, yes. he he saw atonal music yeah as a way to control the normies. Um, yeah. so to, to there's put it very simply horrifying theory that the first record label was made by the Tavistock Institute and the first band they signed on was the Beatles. <laughs> oh, <God>. Yeah, <laughs> I mean he probably was involved with that. That was probably him like being the yeah. middleman. 
Um, oh, actually, there's, a, there's a DJ from the 90s who now writes books on this stuff. I can't remember his name. David Boyd lent me some books on it. Oh. Well, you know, um, you know, uh, Richard D. Hall. Yeah. He did a he did a couple of interviews with like a like a PhD music student, and she's like, she she apparently has literally did a PhD on how Adorno was like evil, <laughs> like wrecked, wrecked, yeah. uh, wrecked everything basically. Um, yeah. Just to answer a bit, was it Duke Valentino asking about it? So this is something that slightly disturbed me, and I haven't gotten to it yet. But the very last essay. In Introduction to Magic Volume 3 is titled Magical Perspectives According to Alistair Crowley. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what on earth is that doing at the back? So I haven't read it. I haven't gotten there yet, but for what I'm going to see glancing at it, it's just kind of pointing in. It's pointing a few things that they're kind of like the forisms that taking in their own rights and ignoring who the guy is, there is something pretty legit in it, and kind of said, well, there has to be something legit in it, because we know this guy was just a straight-up wizard that did things. Mm. I mean, what do you what do you make of Crowley? I mean, because I know a lot of people, they just say, oh, he was just a, a like, he was an idiot and a fed. Like, he didn't, he wasn't actually into magic at all. Mark um, Devlin, that's it. Thank you, Valentino. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Crowley's like, I watched Ankler's video on it actually. <laughs> that was really good. That was very good. But um, the guy gives me the creeps. I can't mm. deny it. Because he gives me the creeps in such a way that it really kind of rankles the bones. I'm like, yeah, he definitely wasn't a straight up fake. I mean, like, from, from, what I've, very from what I've read about him, he seems to have been a man who just used his position to indulge in every excess possible, basically. Yeah, I mean, very um, drugs and constant screwing and yeah, very orgies and feasts. And all, <laughs> I mean, if the thing is, like, to me, and this is a pre-imposed m sort of morality here, but that that to me proves a kind of falseness, it, because if the if the if the if the teleology of your creed is just, oh, I'm just going to overindulge myself in every conceivable way, that to me just strikes it as being false. Well, that's um, so. That's just reminded me of a bit in the Yoga of Power, where it states how with the tantric stuff, which is all about um, pushing the excesses to the greatest beyond to have the realization, is that by doing it a personally, to simply have the experiences as the experiences objectively, you're beyond it. Well, you're just above the morality issue opposed on it. Mm. That it's like it is just a legit magical practice, and that's it. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the so the, the the excess is the magical practice in itself. It, it's it's what the guy's achieving through doing it. Right. And in an ideal scenario, it's never going to wash out into other people. It's going to be kept contained in house in whatever organization like Lodge is doing it. Mm. It should never really bleed out into other people. That's that's where the issues are. Is when it does, because it it could be at the costly um, stakes of someone else that gets washed out in it. And it's the the problem there is when people who aren't doing it magically see these excesses and just take them to the point where they become just evolved animals in doing it, and they mm. just feed the the bestial tastes rather than doing the tantric process of using them to allow the passions to flow forth like a, a raging fountain. Right. I mean, I've got to be honest, it, I, I, I don't think I'll ever really be able to understand it just because my, yeah. it just, it just immediately gives me all sorts of, all sorts of red flags. Yeah. Well, that, that whole concept. The point there, he says, well, it's like, it's, 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 it's disciplined. It's like that orthodox sect that Rasputin was allegedly a part of, where mm. the whole idea was you had to sin as much as possible in order to experience forgiveness. Well, that's just bollocks. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, okay, but you do seem to be having an awful lot of like massive orgies in your cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... I, ran, I ran into that when I was diving into antinomianism and what mm. kind of wacko things that makes people think they can do. Mm. Um, so. 
See, yeah, I, I just noticed um, Julius Flavius in the chat, um, and I, I'm not trying to like start a big argument or anything, but he says um, such indulgences were fine because the men doing so were self-disciplined. They could have yeah. all the sex they wanted without letting letting it carry them away. Now, that essay you posted, the the Eveler essay um, to do with the aristocracy, yeah, he does have a very valid point in that, which is that there's a difference between a degenerate and somebody who is capable of indulging in certain amounts of hmm. um, immorality for an end, basically for a purpose, um, oh, and he's, he's in, and he's in control of it. To that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that I totally understand and I, I completely agree with. But yeah. it does smack a little bit like the sort of Crowleyite type thing. It does smack a bit of the stoner, you know, who's like, "Oh, it's fine, dude. I can walk away whenever I want." You know, it's not. It doesn't control me, man. I need it to relax, type thing. Where you know, but they say that, but they just, you know, the only thing you ever see them doing is smoking weed. Or in this mm. case, the only thing you ever seem to see Al Alistair Crowley doing is having orgies and, and being yeah. immoral. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, sure. You know, you can tell me how much you're in control of this, but mm. it does, you know, you're going to have it's, to. Uh, it's mm. an extremely perilous path. It's like a knife point ridge that even the slightest <laughs> jostle in your balance will send you tipping over the edge into the abyss. What I'm saying is, if I was like a medieval sort of um, bishop or something, I would probably have Crowley burned. To be honest, I would just send him to the stake straight away, or put it, or leave him in the oubliette or something. I, I, I would see if he was really on point with it, you would never know he was doing it because it would be fully in house mm. and be irresponsible. <laughs> Crowley, Crowley was a massive uh, publicity hound. Yeah, so I mean, well, he couldn't, yeah, he couldn't resist the fame of being Alistair Crowley. Yeah, I kind of had the, the ego stuff going on there. I mean, well, I say that. I say that. I mentioned vampirism earlier. So uh, this is where, okay, other author, Dion Fortune kind of comes in here. So for context, she was uh, actually pretty contemporary to Evelyn at the same time. Started off as a psychologist, um, got very interested in what Freud is on about, ended up running into issues where psychology couldn't answer things she was seeing mm -hmm. ends up in the theosophical crowd with Madame Blavatsky. Oh yeah. Um, she does actually end up being, becoming a Kabbalist, which we end up disagreeing with her, but, um, because it's you know, evil, magic. but, um, she, um, she does explain quite well what a vampire is and how it explained a lot of the psychology things she was having to deal with. And that right. you basically have people who can just suck energy out of other people. Mm -hmm. It's the energy. It's the it's the will. It's the passions. The emotive um, kind of potency of someone to yeah. do things and commit to action. These right. people can suck it out. And so I'm imagining. Uh, this is, I'm pretty certain in the case of Crowley, he is such a vampire that forms this cult around him and kind of feeds off people observing what he's doing and them imparting into him their idea that like. Oh wow, this guy is a really powerful wizard. Look at the stuff he's doing. The more they believe it, the more it actually feeds him and makes him so. Because mm. they're giving him the energy, almost like a, a kind of worship. And he's just soaking it up. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I just revolt against it. Absolutely. I mean, um, just we're we're coming towards the two hour mark now. Um yeah. and I well, want yeah. to shut I've got to um I've got a plane to catch quite early in the morning, um, so I can't stay up too late. Yes. Um, so there's a couple of questions in chat. Uh, someone's yeah. a, a pre pre precursor's press says, have Messer's hat and bulk will tried any of the magical techniques in introduction? For instance, the hermetic, um, cad could you see us? Could you say us? Yes, yes. And the mirror. Well, the first, I, I would just answer that and say, no, I haven't tried any magical techniques and I won't be trying them <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm a reactionary Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know in like you know esoteric terms that's kind of pleb to you, but um, you can I, argue just, that by... I just instinctively just go no to all this stuff. I just go no. Mm. I just want to go to mass and you know well, but hey, by engaging in, in a mass correctly done, you're engaging in a magical practice. It's a ritual. Yeah, of course, but it's yeah. not. It's not the. It's not the techniques. Um, well, as far as I know, it's not the techniques outlined in there. I mean, to be fair, I may be. I may be um, confusing it with Evola's more tantric stuff. Um, yeah, the, 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 the tantric stuff is its own kind of thing. It, it's like 1% of everything else. It's just one particular vein in which it could be done, but it's not the vein. Mm. 
So um, they're okay. like the little methods there that presses on about. So they're um, they're kind of like more like mental exercises to, to okay. kind of put into picture the scale of what they are and what they're for. So they're just like meditations or exercises to help you err towards being able to do certain things. So um, I don't want to dwell too much, but one thing that I have I have done quite a lot. And it's quite useful for exercises. Um, it actually does explain it in the Yoga of Power. It also appears again in Volume 1 of Introduction to Magic. And it's the idea that so when you go to bed and you're there resting flat like a plank and you, mm -hmm. you imagine, you know, yes, the sun is setting, but what instead rises is the midnight sun. And as it rises, you move, you climb a mountain in time with it. Okay. And you reach the peak is the moment you fall asleep. And then you sleep. Then when you wake up, the process of waking up, you visualize the process of climbing down the mountain as the midnight sun sets and the real sun comes back up. Okay. Um, um, I mean, I do like that. I do like the aspect of it. I, I'd have to really, I'd have to actually read the works on Tantra. Um, yeah. And the but, kind yeah, of, those sort of practices. Yeah, don't focus too much on the Tantra stuff. Yeah, that's mm. just a small part of it. Okay. There's, there's a lot of universal techniques anyway, but um, yeah, I have to like dive back into two years worth of stuff with me trying to this school to pull out all these little tidbits. You'll have to, to you'll have to be my um my like uh, magister in this regard, yeah. <laughs> just, just education and this sort of thing. Um, uh, da -da. he uh, Duke Duke Valentino says at Panama Hat, do you think the occult is real? Um, yes, in as much as I believe there are. Well, I, essentially, I believe in the diagrams that um, Mr. Bulkwill um, shared with us, um, which I will post links to, um, in terms of a general kind of spiritual outlay. Um, but, I mean, more generally, I believe that there are extremely uh, dark aspects um, to the spiritual world, Some, many of which are not mentioned explicitly in major religions, um, but which nevertheless have to be factored in. Um, I believe that the right sort of people can deal with them in a way that is constructive or, you know, they can, they can resist the corruption, but at the same time, it is a, it is a highly corrupting thing. Um, yeah. more in a more mundane sense. I also just generally believe in the existence of, uh, Satan and, um, various demonic forces, which can very easily corrupt. Well, I mean, I believe they're essentially in everyone. Um, I don't believe anybody is free from sin. Um, so that's. That's my answer to that, unless you meant something else by uh, by that. He also claims that uh, Barbara Bush was Alistair Crowley's son. I have heard this. Is that true? It's pretty hot spice if it is. I also know that he said son. Is this is is this yet another world leader's <laughs> wife who is a tranny? Yeah. It's, it's the inverted rebus is the back of that thing. God. Ugh. Um... Uh, um, Julius Flavius, it is clearly immoral to say what is right for one is fair for the other, where such matters so sexual freedoms are concerned, not everyone can go to Kythera. I mean, yes, I, I, as I said earlier, I do agree with that. I, um, I do think that, um, there has to be a certain tolerance of things at higher levels. I mean, one expression of this is that I've always believed that artists, um, and writers exist on their own plane of morality. Um, in that it doesn't excuse immoral behavior, um, but that it can be necessary in ways that it is n never necessary for you know some random pleb um, mm. to engage in certain practices. Speaking of morals, did you ever get around to reading the essay I shared on esotericism and morality? No, I have not. Really I've, been, I've been too busy writing about the ar aristocracy. Um, yeah. But I will. Yeah. Uh, it is definitely on the list. worth reading. It's definitely worth reading. Okay. Um, I, w I may do like a shorter sort of like follow up video to this stream. Yeah, um, it's too heavy to dive right. into now. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a pretty thick subject. So um, kings in Europe and elsewhere have magical powers. Yes, that's a that's a long standing tradition. Um, yeah. Being touched for evil. Um, and we're not egalitarians. Very true. Um, the elite exercise various rights. Yes. Um, yes, I, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I am a I am a believer in in caste essentially um because I, I i i mean i don't even i don't even believe it as an ideology i just believe it's true it's, it's, it's just a fact um societies are caste based 
Um, do you think demonic possession is real? Yes. Mm. Um, I believe I've seen it. Um, mm. It was horrible. Um, Mr. Hat, I believe your attitude is exceptionally sensible. Well, I am a sensible centrist. Um, <laughs> the thing to remember is that, like, we're not we're not right wing extremists at all. We're not like we're not we're, we're just people with basically correct, healthy views about what a society should look like. That's just, that's basically it. <laughs> we are we are the we're, we're not the extreme ones. The extreme ones are the people that set up a society like the one we're currently living in. I mean, you'd have to be fucking batshit to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, extended to access for drama is sexually dangerous. Yeah, I mean, um, it is dangerous. And it is it is not for the feckless, and even people capable of dealing with it tend to have quite dramatic effects from reaching into that sort of thing. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's always risks of going off the rails. Um, Duke Valentino says, "Did all this originate from mystery schools in Babylon?" No. Say. Does it go back to like um, the temple with um? Neb uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, there's some pretty bad stuff. Like I wouldn't say all of it does, because again, if you uh, so you ha having to attribute locations of emergence for where primordial truths spring forth, but it's always going to be coloured by the culture and the person who does it. So the okay. location kind of does matter in that respect. It, it, it has a tincture to it. Um, most of what Evla talks about is stuff coming from the Hyperborean North. So he, he never really mentioned Babylonian stuff at all, actually. Um, Wiggles hasn't the Catholic Church since condemned Guelphism with the renunciation of temporal power on the papal tiara? Essentially, yeah. I mean, the papacy as it currently stands is a captured institution. Um, I don't actually believe that the the Vatican or the papal state needs to control like huge swathes of Italy. I mean, it's pretty good when it does. I think. <laughs> I mean, it is, I, I, I am a, I am quite a hardcore um, temporalist when it comes to religion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the current Catholic Church is not in any way what I would like it to be. Um, bad vibes. Yeah, very bad vibes. Um, yeah. Though I do have, I do have some hope because um, there is a. There are a lot of renegade cardinals who are very good at organizing because they're Italian and they're cardinals. Um, and oh, hopefully silly. hopefully they should be able to take over the next conclave. Um, uh, a... <laughs> right. Um, I don't I would I would like to stay and just uh, talk to chat for <laughs> for ages because it's quite fun. We should do that. We should just we should do this. We should just like start a stream with no topic outlined and just see what happens. And just 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 tell chat to ask questions. Um, Le uh, Liam McNeil, I have looked into um, uh, set of Um I'm interested by. It. I wouldn't really call myself a set of as such because it it rests on certain doctrinal and legal logic, um, which I'm not saying is false, but it, it essentially I just like to deal with it sort of de facto as it is and the, the de facto situation is just um, there's a uh, um, a rather a rather nutty egotistical liberation theologist like world world economic federation pope who's, who managed to get into power through through a kind of coup on his um, on his more traditionalist predecessor God, God rest his soul. Um, so, um, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. But I mean, to me, that's just the reality of it. Um, I mean, if you want to take that as far as to say that, you know, the, 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 uh, the papacy has been unoccupied for so long, I mean, okay. But, you know, I, I, I prefer to just deal with the temporal reality. I mean, you have to admit, you look back at the history of the papacy. I mean, for a long period of time, you know, th 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 this is far from the worst it's been. <laughs> I mean, essentially, I mean, there have been many more troublesome times with it. I mean, I, I, for, for a lot, lot of its history, it's, it was just an, ex, an extension of Italian politics, you know. And it's, it's, but weirdly, re, re, reading about a lot of this actually gives me more faith rather than less. 
just 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 because it it it's it's sort of like it's sort of like it, it it's the, the the temporal the real world aspect is not hidden or buried it's all there you know it kind of like it it, it illustrates for you the nature of man to such an ironically perfect degree for an institution that is basically concerned with the fallen nature of man if that makes sense um i don't know i may just be going off on a complete tangent here but um it's an interesting tangent. yeah um mm. anyway um i think we'll call it a night there um because i have to finish packing and get to bed um oh, this is a hot answer to valentino's go match a real is a thing i don't trust it got bad vibes there you go um pro Cusurus press if i read pagan imperialism yes if you go back and find the evil a day stream from 2021 on aa's channel i talk about that a bit there what have I um, that week but I'll, I'll i'll have to do a proper um discourse on that sometime uh right then mm. thank you everyone for watching um mr bulkwell do you have any online things people can find you at or find your work at uh <laughs> No, because I'm no, I to keep being, yeah, it's just hard to get out. It's this mysterious <laughs> wizard that sometimes appears, yeah. You never you never made the mistake of going online. Um, um lucky Twitter, no. <laughs> um all right then. Um well, I mean everyone who's watching this channel knows who I am, so <laughs> it's yeah. never really need to prove well, anything. Um it, thank you everyone for watching. Um I will probably return with some stuff post Italy. Um I've still got a bit of time off. Um, I have been. I was thinking of doing like a documentary series on Spain to 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 exercise that particular autistic ghost. Um, so I was planning on doing a long live stream series that never came about with Turnip. Um, just Which actually, just I mean, just actually, just like you know, get tons of stock footage from that period and just do like an actual sort of you know documentary. Um, just like Spain, 1870 to 1960 or something. Um, but that would be like weeks, weeks, weeks and weeks of editing. So it'll happen when it happens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you for watching. And um, GN. yeah, GN. <laughs>